Hello, everybody. Um, welcome to my presentation. Uh, my name is Dr. Perry Cows, and this presentation today is The Ancient Egyptians Were Black Africans. And this is the first part in a three part series. This first part will look at evidence from ancient writings. The second part will look at archaeological evidence. And the third presentation will explain why all of the confusion, all of the unnecessary confusion. But it's political. I'll explain that in the third presentation. But I can very easily make it clear to you in this first and second presentation that the ancient Egyptians, the Kemites, were clearly black Africans. Before I move on, let me just begin by talking about what we mean by black and what we mean by African. Now, I know that in many places, black is a political term. And I would say here in the United States, black is largely political to, because we're talking about a, a group of people who the government historically has had a particular attitude towards, um, you know, legally and socially. And now socially, the country in general regardless of an individual's race or background, they, they believe that they can designate who is black by looking at them. And of course, that comes with a specific belief or attitude towards that person, regardless if we want to admit that um, or not. And I'm, I'm well aware of that in some places, uh, particularly those places in the Caribbean that were colonized by Portugal and those places that were colonized by Spain, um, black kind of has a different meaning because you can have people who may be a shade or maybe two shades lighter than me and they won't consider themselves um, black. But nonetheless, uh, <clears throat> when I'm talking about black, I am talking about people who would be designated as black political, historically in a political sense and currently in a social sense in the United States melanated people all right and the reason why i'm saying these things is because i realize that some people like to say about the ancient egyptians that they were black that they were um african but they were not black which is subterfuge right that is just a strategy to create more confusion i'll talk a lot more about that in the third presentation um but i'm just mentioning it now for the sake of clarity and then uh, I will say that beyond a shadow of a doubt, the ancient Egyptians were clearly um, African, um, not s simply in a phenotypical sense, not simply in the sense of how they appeared, although we will, how, how, of their appearance, we will address that. But as far as their origins, their culture, and their connections are concerned, the ancient Egyptians were clearly black Africans. And clearly uh, African. So let's go ahead and get this show on the road. And I'll begin with this uh, slide. And this, let me go ahead and turn my webcam off because I know y'all are probably distracted by looking at my um, pretty face. So here we have the people of the Afro-Asiatic cultural and linguistic group in um, Africa. Now, Africa has five major cultural and uh, linguistic groups, um, Afro-Asiatic, the Khoisan, who many people are familiar with, the Nilo-Saharan, the most populous group, which is the Niger-Congo, and then the group from Madagascar, um, that Madagascan language that they speak is its own grouping, its own family. So those five groups compose the major um, African cultural and linguistic groups. Now, like I said, the most populous is the Niger-Congo. I think that the Niger-Congo and the Afro-Asiatic, Afro well, I know that they are the most populous, and I think that they also get the most attention. So let's begin with the Afroasiatics, and this is important because the ancient Egyptians fall within this group 
first and foremost, I have to say that this term Afro-Asiatic is misleading. This suggests that, that there were black people in Asia. Now, historically, there were, of course, black people um, in Asia because, hum because humans migrated out of a Africa into Asia before there were Asians with the phenotype that we see today with the the epicanthal folds that you call slanted eyes or chinky eyes, but without the melanin, those people are just were just descendants of the original people who had epicanthal folds, slanted eyes, chinky eyes, but who had melanin. So the process of them losing that melanin began about seventy five thousand years ago. And then of course the first people to go into Europe were um Africans. You can see that by the Grimaldi. Look up Grimaldi, man, if you need more information um, about that. But um, when we say Afro-Asiatic, this is very misleading because, like I said, those people left from Africa into the various places, so they were African or Africoid. Now, in 1955, a man by the name of Joseph Greenberg came up with the name for these groupings. He came up with the name Afro-Asiatic. However, in reality, the name of this group should be Ethiopic. They should be called the Ethiopic group. And the reason why they should be called that is because we can see with all of these groups, um, Libyo-Chadic, Egypto-Semitic, um, Cushitic, Om Omotic, all of these groups have their origin in Ethiopia. So I won't go so far to say that humanity originated in Ethiopia. Um, I myself believe that humanity, us Homo sapiens sapiens, originated um, near um, Lake Victoria. But I think that what happened is in the area of Ethiopia, in those highlands, because of safety, because of the exchange of information, um, you have a rapid increase in knowledge, exchange of knowledge, growth in population, and that's why that region took off and those pe pe people began to disperse throughout the Mediterranean and Red Sea and into Asia, Europe, etc. Um, but they should be called Ethiopic because they originated in Ethiopia. They did not originate anywhere in Asia. Now, why did Greenberg do that? Uh, just because at that time they were still of the belief that humanity originated um, in Asia and they were slowly coming in, into this understanding it was probably safer to do it that way. We know that Greenberg knew that the languages originated in um, Ethiopia, but nonetheless, they were given this name um, Afro-Asiatic. But let's look at these people. And let's look at the groups that comprise the Ethiopic group that many of you know as Afro-Asiatic. And we'll begin with the Libyo-Chadic peoples. Now, here, um, let me turn my whiteboard on. Okay, yeah. Now, this woman is a Berber stock. She's um, Tomashek. She's from the Tomashek people. And these folks are Hausa people who live in um, primarily in northern um, Nigeria. They migrated pretty far. Now, several of the groups migrated um, a good distance, particularly um, these two groups here. But, but um, they're kind of overlooked because they're not Niger Congo as the other people in Nigeria are. They are Ethiopic, Afro-Asiatic. And uh, like I said, they live in the northern part of, uh, of Nigeria. These folks here are, are Coptic people, and I'm going to talk about all of these groups a little bit, a little bit more. This man is Beja. These sisters are Somali. And this beautiful woman, she's very striking. She's Omotic. Now, um, <clears throat> let's talk a little bit of, about these people. Now, let's look at this woman, the Tamashek woman. Now, would she pass for black 
in the United States. I mean, no, she's um, African, but will she pass for black in the United States? What about these Hausa people here just beneath the Tamashek woman? Would they pass for black? Now, here um, we see the Egypto-Semitic um, group. And the closest that you will come today to actual Egyptian people or actual ancient Egyptian language is the Coptic people. And there you'll see them in Ethiopia and um, Egypt today. And uh, because the picture is a little bit small, you can't see it very clearly, but they very clearly have Afrikaid, African um, blood um, in them. And I chose this particular picture because it is um, a little bit older. I'm not exactly sure when this picture was 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 uh, taken, but I think it was in the 20th century. And you can see um, just by looking at them, like I said, the, the African blood um, that's within them. And the reason why I didn't choose a contemporary picture, because even if you look at the contemporary picture, you can see the um, that the people were not white. But they have been overrun by the white um, Arabs. Their bloodline has been overrun by um, by whites from um, different um, places. So um, I didn't choose the picture for that reason. I thought this one would be a little bit bit closer. And like if you go to Egypt today, if you're in northern Egypt, you'll see a lot of um, people who are white Arabs or look like white Arabs. When you go to the middle parts of Egypt, you'll see more black blood. I remember being there one time. One black man came from behind the, the uh, that came out of the kitchen in the restaurant he was working at to talk to us, and he just had like an instant camaraderie with us. He was very happy to see us. And then, of course, if you go to the southern part of Egypt, you'll see blacks all over the place. Now, within that Egypto-Semitic group are um, the Semite Semitic um, people, and um, I'll get to them um, shortly. The Cushitic group, you see the picture at the top. That man is Beja. Now, the Beja live in the desert. Desert. They live in one of the oases um, in Egypt, in the kind of like the south southwestern um, part. And they still, to this day, acknowledge um, in that in that specific um, place in the in the um, oases in southwest Egypt, they still acknowledge the great deity Sekhmet as the, uh, their primary deity of worship. And beneath is um, two Somali um, ladies. Now, would all would these people pass as black in today's world? I mean, look at this Beja. Man, I swear I saw him on the on the train the other day, you know. And then look at the Omotic um, woman. Uh, would she pass as black? So here you have the, the 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 Grand Ethiopic family. And if you look at the people from the various groups, they all are black. So how could it be? that just this one group out of all of them is not black. And that is the people who the Egyptians and the people who were trying to slow down time and slow down the evolution and slow down learning. They want to stagnate to society to maintain certain privileges. Of course, we'll get to that in the third presentation. But they're mis they are purposely misleading us when they try to convince us that the ancient Egyptians were not black. So I did not mention the Semitic group. I'm going to go ahead and get into them now. And let's begin with the ancient Hebrews. So we know that Hebrews and uh, Arabs are both Semitic. A lot going on, on a lot going on there. But I'm going to bring some writings to kind of give an indication as to what those specific people thought about themselves and what they said about themselves. So I'm going to draw here from 
the war scrolls. Now, in the first century of the Common Era, some people know that as the AD Era, um, there were several fights between the Romans and Hebrews who fought to preserve their culture. Now, all of the Hebrews didn't, did not fight to preserve their culture. A good number of them was uh, accommodationists. But those who fought to preserve um, who they were, fought to preserve, for, to preserve their culture, to stave off colonialism from the Romans, they had a number of writings. And one of those writings that was found in a, in a um, cave, it's in the, that cave was next to the Dead Sea. That's why they call the, uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls. But within that corpus of Dead Sea Scroll writings are the war scrolls. And the war scrolls describe the battle of the children of light against the children of darkness. And the, these Hebrews saw themselves as the children of, children of light. And I'll, I'll read their quote. We can all read together. It says, at the beginning of the undertaking of the sons of light, they shall start against the lot of the sons of darkness. So we can see they clearly see themselves as the sons of light, and they see their detractors, Romans included, as the sons of darkness. They go on to say, the sons of Levi, the sons of Judah, and the exiles of the desert shall fight against them and their forces. When the exiles of the sons of light return from the desert, and here shall be great tumult against the sons of Japheth. Now, who are the sons of Japheth? Firstly, we know that the sons of Japheth must be uh, separate from them, must be distinct from them, or else this word would not have been used. So who are the sons of Japheth? It's the Europeans. Right. So this right here isn't smoking gun evidence. But when you look at all of the evidence in its entirety, it becomes more and more clear, very clear that the ancient Egyptians and all of the people of the Ethiopic, um, also known as Afro-Asiatic linguistic family, were black African people. And you can see here they're identifying themselves as distinct from from the whites. Now, let's talk about the Arabs. The Arabs have a kind of a similar situation and this is because one of the things that the history books never ever mention. Mainstream um, history never mentioned this to you and what they don't mention is that you have black Hebrews um, and, and in fact the oldest fossils found outside of Africa are found in what is today Israel, 95,000 years old. 95,000 years ago, there were not even any black people, I mean, there were not even any white people on the planet. There were albinos, but there were no whites. Um, <clears throat> so, and this is, can we find a similar situation with the Hebrews as we, as we do with the um, Arabs and those people who went into Arabia, who, who migrated from Ethiopia and ultimately found their way into Arabia, were black um, Africans. And when the whites began to come from the stretches of the north, one of the men documented this, and his name was El Jahiz. And we can see the years in which he lived, 776 to 868. This picture is not con contemporaneous. This is not a picture that was taken or a drawing that was done of him at that time. The picture is speculation. Now, Jahiz was a, he was a Renaissance man. He wrote about many different things. He wrote about um, zoology. He had a good bit of anthropology um, in his writings. He was prolific, very well respected. But one of the things that he wrote about was the difference between what we would call today blacks and whites, which ultimately mean um, people who have descended from African, African blood line, African genetics and culture, and the people who have descended from Europe. Or, um, and, you know, to some extent, um, Asia, but for the most part, Europe. And he wrote several books in his book, Glory of the Blacks Over the Whites. He talked about the actual process 
of whites coming in into Arabia and how Arabia had already been black um, at that time. Now this was something he was interested in. He talked about race explicitly. One of the books that he wrote was the Treatise on the Pure Born and the Misogynated. And this book is not extant. This the writings of this book cannot be cannot be found. But the glory of the blacks over the whites make it very clear that when we're talking about uh, Arabia, Arabia was first black before non blacks came into um, Arabia. So that is important and it's worth mention. You can kind of look at what I've said so far and you can clearly see that um, Afro-Asiatic uh, or which what should really be called Ethiopic was black. But I'm going to go a little bit further and I'm going to talk about the ancient Egyptians um, in particular. But yes, the Ethiopic linguistic cultural family originated from Ethiopia, not Asia. Also, before I move on, let me mention that if you are interested in this information, if you want more of this information or more depth, you might want to look into some of my um, educational materials that I've created. On the left is the book that I wrote called Beyond Ma'afa. Now, Ma'afa is a Swahili word. It means great disaster. This book is called Beyond Ma'afa because it goes beyond Ma'afa in a couple of different ways. Uh, first, it doesn't begin our history with, with um, slavery. When we begin our history with slavery, that's kind of handicapping um, blacks in general. It's misleading every, every, everybody. So this book begins with our actual human origins and shows archaeological evidence, genetic evidence, and it goes all the way to the uh, to contemporary times. So that's the other way that it goes beyond Ma'afa, by talking about how we can move beyond the remnants of slavery and the remnants um, of the Ma'afa. And we call it Ma'afa because so many people are attracted to the word slave trade but that word slave trade is very misleading because those people on those boats were seldom slaves. Very seldom were they an actual slave in um, Africa. What happens is that they are captives. Now, a big difference between a slave and a captive. Slave is a legal, legal term. Nonetheless, this book is an extraordinary educational tool. If I may say so myself, it's ideal for homeschoolers, uh, class, college um, classrooms. Um, teachers can learn a lot from this book and I know many of you are wondering who is this man on the cover. His name is Dangerfield Newby and the movie Django Unchained, the character that's played up by Jamie Foxx, is based on this man's life and I address him um, in this book um, also. And to the right is a video from a video series that I did called The Foundations of Nile Valley Civilization. This information that I'm talking about in this presentation will be in this video and also in the book. The video is a, an excellent tool because a lot of people like like video and because of the production was done by a videographer who's also a musician. So it's interesting and has some um, really good music and production. So I. I would suggest both of these um, educational materials and you can see the link for them in the description box below. So let's talk about the um, evidence and how the ancient Egyptians saw themselves. Now the ancient Egyptians were oriented towards the south. They acknowledged um, the peoples who came before them and acknowledged, and acknowledged that they came from the south. They they really didn't pay much attention to the area beyond the Red Sea or beyond the Mediterranean until more so in the Middle Kingdom and then um, more consistently, more dedicatedly during the New Kingdom. And that's primarily because of the threats coming from, from those, um, those regions. But they claim the southern origin and they claim to come from a group of people called the Shimsu Huru. 
and the Shem Tsuhuru came from the southern um, highlands. So here, um, this hieroglyph, this is the Shem, here this hieroglyph, it's Su, Shem Su, and this word means follower, and the hieroglyphs has these, um, these clarifiers to make things clear. So here, we know we're talking about a, a person following. So why do we have these three little lines right here? This is to show plurality, not just one follower, but followers, right? Several followers. The followers of who, though? The followers of, of what? The followers of Heru, as we see here symbolized by this um, by this hieroglyph. So the Shimsuhuru were from the south. The ancient Egyptians acknowledged that they were um, descendants of the Shimsuhuru. Now we know by contemporary studies that there are people who came from all over the place to the Nile. This is before the country was established in 5500 BCE and then um, <clears throat> But but the greatest influence, the cultural influence, as I will show in this presentation and in the, in the next presentation that I do that will show the archaeological evidence, comes from the South. And that is um, important to keep in mind because you cannot make sense of who these people are without having some understanding of, uh, of migration. So in ancient times as well as now, that was the two cradle theory. And what the two cradle theory um, suggests is that you have two cradles of civilization with different, not only different geographical origins, but different cultural and behavioral traits. And one of the cradles would be the, um, the heartland of Africa and the other cradle would be Europe and in that um, African southern cradle we see things like um, agriculture, um, harmony between masculine and feminine that's in these spiritual, um, esoteric as well as the practical everyday sense and I know that they didn't put women necessarily on par with men it wasn't that whole simplistic idea of being equal but the women weren't uh, um, abused as a part of the uh, as a part of the culture, and they could get divorced. They could inherit property. All of these things that you don't that you don't see in Europe, you don't see in Rome, you don't see in Greece and such. Um, <clears throat> and um, the northern cradle, which is the European, you know, just a little bit more challenging environment because of the difficulties in production, because of the the weather and the misogyny that's um in, entrenched in that culture. You can argue that if if you want, but there's vast um, evidence. All I ask, if you argue with me, make your argument futile. I mean, make your make your argument public, so I can refute it publicly. So, from the Middle Kingdom of ancient Egypt, um, <clears throat> there was the in, um, in, um, in, uh, instruction that was written for one of the kings, Merikare, in one of the quotes from this uh, piece of uh, literature is, and I, we can read together, Lo, the miserable Asiatic. He is wretched because of the, um, he is wretched because he's in short of water, because of the place he's in, short of water, bare of wood, its pets are many and painful because of mountains. He does not dwell in one place. Food propels his legs. He fights since the time of Horus. So this is a suggestion about the character and the personality of the people from the, the northern cradle. Now, why do I um, show this, this quote? It is to show that the ancient Egyptians consistently made the distinction between themselves and the people from Asia or the people from Europe. They do not um, 
they do not really associate themselves with them in the sense of being the same um, people. Now, Pliny. Now, Pliny was a Roman scholar, we can see when he wrote, when he um, lived, and he said something similar. Pliny wrote, and we can all read together, for it, it is for it is beyond question that the Ethiopians are burnt by the head of the heavenly body near them and are born with a scorched appearance with curly beard and hair, and that in the opposite region of the world, the race have white frosty skin with yellow hair that hangs straight, while the latter are fierce owing to the rigidity of their climate, talking about the, um, the whites, while the latter are fierce owing to the rigidity of their climate, but the former are wise owing to the mobility of theirs, right? So what he's talking about, the people of Ethiopia, Tassidi in Sudan, ultimately ancient Egypt, they have a little bit more abundance because when they began to come into themselves, they had access to that, um, you know, food, and then they were more easily they were more inclined to cooperate and, and then, of course, more inclined to pass down knowledge from generation to generation, have a more um, harmonious um, culture as far as their interaction with each other um, is, is concerned. So we can see, once again, he's promoting that two-cradle theory. And I am throwing this all at you for the people who want to believe that the ancient Egyptians were a so-called mixed race, like some whites, some reds, some yellows, some blacks just happened to fall upon the same place and, and develop this, this distinct culture. But the culture isn't necessarily distinct because it borrows from the people of the highland, the people of Sudan, and the people of Ethiopia. And I'll show you that further, more, more in this presentation, as well as my upcoming presentation on the archaeological um, evidence and I did not mean to go beyond um, Diodorus Siculus the Greek scholar and let's see what Diodorus um, had to say Diodorus wrote they say also that the Egyptians are colonists sent out by the Ethiopians Asar having been the leader of the colony now I did infuse that name um, Asar but they probably said something else like Osiris or something like that all right. For instance, the belief that their kings are that their kings are gods, the very special attention which they pay to their burials, and many other matters of a similar nature are Ethiopian practices, while the shapes of their statues and the forms of their letters are Ethiopian. Tune in for my next presentation, and I'll show you how the language went from uh, like like down the Nile from the Sudan into um, Egypt. But we see just more of the same. The people of antiquity knew it. Why are so many people ignorant to it today? And that's because of the Egyptologists. But we'll get into that in our next couple of presentations. And also, let me mention here Homer. Now, Homer is important for a couple of different reasons. Firstly, Homer's book, The Iliad, is the, it's the very first piece of European literature ever written, 1850 BCE. Yet by the time we get to 1850 BCE, ancient Egypt, as Dr. Um, Clark, John Henry Clark would say, is experiencing the end of their very long and mighty walk. Yet at this time, the Europeans are only now coming into higher culture of, of writing. The objective here is to liberate the ancient Egyptians, the Kemites, from this kidnapping that the, um, and this lying on them that the Egyptologists have done by trying to associate them with anything other than Africa, including people from um, other planets. They rather have you believe that the ancient Egyptians were from Pluto or some somewhere else 
than to believe that they were clearly um, African. So here we are, we see that the Iliad, as, as, um, as we see by way of the Iliad, Europeans are only now beginning to write. But let's look at what Homer had to say in the Iliad. Zeus had yesterday to ocean's bounds set forth to feast with Ethiopia's faultless men, and he was followed there by all the gods. See, so look at the centrality of Ethiopia in the conceptualization of all of the ancients, right? And look at the association of Ethiopia with um, ancient um, Egypt. So the evidence, I think, tells the story. The ancient Egyptians clearly originated from the heartland of um, Africa. Um, this evidence that I presented to today is the tip of the iceberg in my next presentation in this um, Ancient Egyptians Were Black series will deal with um, archaeology and then the third presentation will explain why we have all of the confusion um, today. So I think it's pretty clear that the Ancient Egyptians were black Africans. Um, I, this video will be in different places including YouTube. If you want to comment in the comment section, feel free to comment. I know that there'll be some anonymous people who will try to release their frustration. This information can be very angering to people because you know some people there who they are as a person is completely tied to the whole idea of race or race supremacy or race inferiority or or however they conceive of it. So when we begin to try to correct some of the lies and misunderstandings that have been promoted um, publicly and in public education during the past, you're going to see a whole lot of people get defensive. And that's okay because that denial is the first step in their evolution. Um, so I welcome anybody to comment in the comment section. Let me know, was this evidence um, convincing? Do you have some, um, some sensible, um, reasonable um, questions? And just um, let me know. And also, I appreciate you taking the time to hear this presentation. Also, remember to listen to the um, upcoming presentations and the book Beyond Ma'afa and the DVD Foundations of Nile Valley Civilization. They are produced in a way so that you will be able to, you will, you will have clear, in-depth understanding that will enable you to teach um, other people. My educational products are designed so that other people can come into the understanding that I have without having to take the time and energy that I've had to take to come to this understanding and even go beyond my um, understanding. So I thank everybody for listening. Watch the next presentation in the description box. Go and order the book and the DVD. Thank you very much.